Let's hear it for the next lightning talk. It's so good to see uh, so many of you turn up in the morning and uh, really excited to you know, present here today. Uh, my name is Manas Manohar and I'm a senior product designer with a fintech startup called Cash Free Payments. Uh, I'm originally from Pune, but otherwise I'm a typical Bangalore boy living the typical peak Bangalore life. I live in Indranagar, go to office in Kormangla and get stuck at Sony signal traffic every day in the morning in between. So, uh, but once eventually I get to office, I own the design and user experience for one of Cashfree's new products called Risk Shield. And uh, it's, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about Risk Shield later here today. Uh, but essentially why I'm here today in front of you is I just want to share a couple of stories, right? So maybe let's begin this the way we used to, you know, begin stories back uh, in childhood, right? Once upon a time in 2019, I almost got scammed. And uh, it, the story goes like I, I tried to list some of my furniture on one of these uh, listing platforms. We want to sell it. And uh, I got an immediate call after 15 minutes or so. And then this guy is like, I'm interested to buy the sofa. And uh, this guy is like, he's ready to pay anything. He's not bargaining. He's ready to send me the money right away without even coming to see it. And then he sends me the link. And this is the new era. Uh, UPI was just starting out, right? And I was back in college in 2019. So he sent me this link and that's where I realized he actually sent me the link to receive money from me and not really to send it to me. And he's trying to create hurry. He's still on the phone. He's like, click the link. It's only for 30 seconds, all of that. I got lucky. I didn't click on the link and I did not actually make a payment. But uh, essentially a lot of people do, right? So it turns out I'm not the only one who has ever faced fraud. So we come across these sort of news articles on a very, very regular basis. And uh, it's almost so regular these days that uh, the news articles seem to have created a template around it, right? It goes like fill in the blanks. Who loses how much to what type of a fraud, right? So they're just literally playing fill in the blanks. It's so common these days. But, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, this list goes on. So there are so many cases of individuals being affected by fraud. But uh, here's a quick question for all of you here. How many of you believe that such online frauds also affect businesses? Can we do a quick raise of hands? Oh, a lot of people are already aware, you know, that businesses are of course being, uh, you know, affected by fraud. But today let's look at how they're actually being affected, right? So uh, let's go into the next story, right? So this is a story of a fraud, of course, oversimplified. Um, let's take an example. He's a, he's a fraudster. He's, he steals a credit card from a girl named Ankita, right? And as soon as he steals it, he uses a card to actually go and buy a laptop worth rupees one lakh from TechCard, which is like an e-commerce, like, you know, an e-commerce online electronic store. And TechCard actually thinks, ki, okay, this is a legitimate payment, right? He make, gets the payment, ships the laptop back to the fraudster. And that's exactly where Ankita, who is our real card holder, she realizes that she's been duped, right? She's been scammed. There's a, she gets a message and she goes, WTF, like, what is happening? And is this the end, right? Maybe for the news publishers, this is the end of it. They will just go with their template, Bengaluru woman loses one lakh to credit card fraud. But the story does not end here, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what goes behind the headlines today. So uh, again, this is going to be over, oversimplified. I used over twice, so it's going to be super uh, simplified. So nobody likes to lose money really, right? So what Ankita does is she immediately calls bank to report the fraud that has happened. And what bank does is they hit tech cart with something called a chargeback. And every business is essentially, they hate chargebacks, right? So this is something that they hate. So uh, chargeback is essentially a, a dispute case of some sort. You know, there's some, something is wrong. You guys need to, you guys need to uh, investigate this further. And uh, chargebacks are like, as I said, they, every business hates it. And this can result in operational costs, legal fees, as well as uh, many a times banks will actually hold business ka settlements. So they're like, until and unless you resolve this, we're not going to uh, get you your uh, working income flowing. So there's a big, big, uh, like, you know, literally makes the companies cry. And sometimes in order to avoid a lot of these costs, what they actually do is they actually give a refund, right? So they're actually like, I don't want my, for one lakh rupees, I can't afford to, uh, like bank can't hold my 50 lakhs, right? So let me just process the refund. And they have to do that. And essentially what's happening is they have lost the product. They have had to pay a refund. And on top of that, right, there's, there's also a chargeback fee, which is like a fine that is put, to, uh, put by the payment methods or, you know, or bank. And they also suffer reputational damage. So it really is, it's, it's really bothersome, right? So one fraud and it's affecting business in so many ways. Uh, essentially, there was a study done by this uh, organization in the US, uh, very creatively named the true cost of fraud, because that's exactly what it says, right? 
For every one rupee loss to fraud, businesses in India face a four rupees of total loss, right? So it's literally like four times. Um, but you know, uh, we uh, at Cash Free, we also uh, we are uh, we have one of the offering called Payment Gateway. So we help businesses collect this kind of payments. So we asked ourselves a very simple question: What if we never let that fraudulent transaction to happen in the first place? The entire rest of the story could have been avoided. Ankita would have been safe. Everything, right? The business will not take a hit. So we tried to build something uh, around this, and uh, essentially that is why we built a product called Risk Shield. It's out there in the market for about like it's live for about one year now. We started working on it about one and a half year uh, ago in in in, in cash free. And uh, Risk Shield is essentially a fraud prevention and a risk mitigation sort of a platform. So it helps protect our merchants, like our businesses that we serve in cash free, uh, from online payments fraud. And uh, we're going to dive a little bit into Risk Shield today and what its capabilities are, how we about how we went about designing it, right? Actually. Uh, so Risk Shield's design is based on the proactive UX framework. Uh, essentially, what proactive UX is like? Uh, here's the here's the de dictionary definition for proactive, right? It's simple: taking action by causing change and not only reacting to change when it happens. Just being a little bit in control, being ahead, like one step ahead, right? We all know what UX means. So essentially, we applied this sort of a framework and we created these three important pillars of this framework, right? So first one is prevent. What if we prevent the fraudulent transactions from happening in the same place? It's fairly simple. Number two, if the transaction still goes through, how are we going to enable our users to respond to it? As simple as that. Sometimes fraud comes to you, it hits you, right? So how, how am I going to create solutions such that the users can actually take action on what has happened? Now, how do they recover from this, right? And the third is to evolve. Like we, we process so many payments over uh, every single minute, right? So can we use users' data and all of this analytics to actually evolve our systems, build systems in such a way that actually, again, going back and av avoiding the frauds, right? So because fraud, there are newer and newer type coming up every single day. So how are we going to evolve our systems? Uh, essentially, if you look at the framework, you'll realize this is not a design framework at all. This is a framework to actually build products where there are high stakes involved, just like in our case, where there's payments, right? So pe we don't want people to lose their hard-earned money. And uh, you can also kind of look at this framework in a different way, like it kind of applies to playing a game of chess, wherein you need to prevent your pieces from getting killed. Uh, you need to respond to your opponent's move every single time, right? And essentially, eventually you evolve your game plan in order to give a checkmate. So that's essentially like what it's all about. And uh, But I think that's, that's enough of funda. So we can go into a couple of work examples, some snippets of work on how Risk Shield is designed and how we actually put this sort of a framework to build some of the features that we have in Risk Shield today. Number one, prevent. So here we look at how can we prevent fraud from happening in the first place. Proactive UX is all about keeping users in control, right? So here we build this sort of a flow, flow builder. It's like a smart real-time flow builder, wherein our merchants can actually select the kind of, it's, it's a very complex rule rather, but we kind of try to simplify it. Uh, and you can also notice how, as and when user is trying to interact with each and every input field, they're getting a real-time preview, right? You need to be one step ahead. You need to always keep user in control. So they need to know what they're trying to build here, right? So this is just one example of one of the features that we have called the smart rules. And this is how we design the flow to you know, keep it extremely intuitive for the users to actually build it. Number two is respond. So we realized that initially we were just blocking all the fraudulent transactions. But essentially what is happening is not a lot of merchants, uh, they, they are a little skeptical. What if you actually block some of my transactions, which are uh, my regular customers' transactions? I don't want my regular customers' transactions getting blocked. right? So we created this uh, tool called actually flagging transactions. So now we, again, keep users in control by enabling them to actually take actions. Like they can select if they want to flag it or if they want to block it, and they can actually take actions on all the risky transactions that you get. This is a snippet of one of the, one of the, one of the features. But most importantly, right, like uh, how are we going to, and, and the, the third part is where we are kind of focusing on now. This is just one example which has kind of recently gone live, and we are focusing more on this, is evolution. We prevented fraud, we are able to respond, but we are collecting a lot of data. And we, know, we have data of our merchants, we have data across so many merchants in, 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 in our country and even international. So uh, here's, here's a, just an example, right? So in, in this particular piece, we had to do a risk analysis. So we have a feature called blacklisting, and merchants wanted to just simply blacklist some known fraud UPIs, right? Just take an example. And essentially, this is what the PRD was expecting, right? So PRD's expectation was very, very simple. So they put a screenshot from our competitor. They're like, once people are trying to upload something to Blacklist, let's just show them how many disputed transactions came from this. 
Let's show them how many successful transactions were made, and let's just show them how many failed. But there's nothing proactive about this. This seems like a very lazy approach to me. So when product manager came to me, Manas, we want to build this. I'm like, can we look at it differently? Why do you want to show this data? Essentially, we want to do it so that user can take a more informed decision whether they want to go ahead and blacklist the 100 set of numbers or they want to maybe rethink. So here's what we built. So it kind of does the risk analysis and shows uh, this, right? So here's what we did. We actually created bucketing, right? So instead of just throwing all the data in front of the users, okay, 100, ye dekhlo, this, this, these many exist. We kind of bucketed them into simple high risk, low risk, and unknown risk transactions. The colors don't seem to be rendering very well, but you get an idea, I think. So uh, now you can see that merchant can actually take an informed decision out of the 100 numbers he actually uploaded. Only 84 of them are what the system is recognizing to be hard, high risk. And these six of them can be actually low risk, which could be our regular customers, right? We don't want them to block. So now they can actually take a decision, I only want to go ahead and block the high risky ones. I don't want to touch maybe these, right? So again, it's all about keeping the user in control. Good design has always been to me what, uh, good design is always about uh, keep, keep creating a design that talks back to the user. Right? At least that, that is it for me, right? So uh, here's the last slide. I wanted to conclude, but I thought, okay, let's not do conclusion. What if we start something from the conclude, uh, conclusion slide and we are running out of time? So I have a prompt for you here today. Uh, suppose you're a designer at ISRO, high stakes uh, product, right? What proactive UX approaches would you consider while designing an interface for astronauts in a space shuttle? Feel free to take a, a picture. Maybe we can discuss what are your thoughts on this. And maybe you can even feel free to share your thoughts on LinkedIn and maybe you'll be able to find me here. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>